Okay, so um, this week's lab seems to have gone uh, fairly well for everybody. Everybody was able to, that I spoke to any, uh, got it working. So our CDK is uh, up and running at this stage. And as I said to you before, we'll be using the CDK right throughout uh, the semester. So I started talking the last day about the serverless uh side of this module i guess you could call it an architecture and uh, what we know are just the fundamentals probably something that you would have known already anyway serverless simply means that we don't have to concern ourselves with provisioning servers in the aws world that would mean provisioning an ec2 instance configuring it, maintaining it, keeping it up to date in terms of patching, installing software, all of that stuff is um, redundant when you decide to move into a serverless uh, architecture or a serverless platform. And so in, uh, in next week's lab, this lab here, the labs are slightly out of sync with the lectures, I suppose, but uh, this lab here steps you through just some of the very basics of the serverless offerings from AWS. Uh, but there will be at least two more labs dealing with, uh, if not three more labs dealing with uh, some other serverless services. So we're going to spend a few weeks on this topic. So these are the slides again. And I can skip through the first few because I introduced those the last day. Uh, so here I'm just listing some of the AWS serverless services. There are quite a number of them and growing. And on the right there is your kind of classic web application. If you can think back to the web applications that you developed uh, last year in the Web App Dev 2 module, where you had a, if you remember, you had a React client, which would be running in the browser, and you had a RESTful Web API backend. Well, if we were to deploy that uh, application to the AWS serverless platform, then what you might do is you might actually deploy the React, a static form of the React app into an S3 bucket. Um, you would break up the RESTful web API into a number of functions. And each of those functions would be uh, encapsulated in a Lambda, what's called a Lambda. So you can imagine now you had a number of these Lambdas each implementing some piece of functionality. Uh, the user authentication side would be handled by a service called Cognito, which is a serverless uh, user management service, which we will use uh, probably two weeks time. API Gateway is a service, which is essentially kind of a front end to all of these lambdas. So at runtime, what would happen, the user would uh, uh, load in whatever URL of the application into their browser. That would cause a request from their browser to go to the S3 service and grab the React app, all of its code, return it back. The code would load into the browser. The, br the user then interacts with the app and many of the interactions would cause a request to be sent to this API gateway uh, service and it would forward the request on to one of the lambdas. Uh, the lambdas would do their thing, whatever functionality they implement. Uh, many of them would involve interacting with a database. Our database is down here. We would be using a service called DynamoDB, which is just one of AWS's serverless database services database response lambda handles the response sends the response back to api gateway api gateway sends the response back to the browser and on and on it goes uh, 
Okay. So there are five, one, two, three, four, five ser serverless services being used there to implement your pretty standard uh, client rendering web application. And what we will do uh, is we'll, we'll just take care of this part of it here, right? We won't bother with the, uh, we won't bother with the front end react kind of stuff. We we'll leave that out of it. Okay, that's uh, ultimately my objective over the next uh, two or three weeks. So on the left here, I'm just listing again, some of the serverless services. AWS Lambda is, uh, AWS is AWS's main compute service. Uh, DynamoDB is their, is one of their serverless database services. And uh, specifically DynamoDB is a NoSQL, but there are serverless relational database services as well. Um, Cognito, as I said, was, takes care of user management and not user authentication. Uh, Gateway, is a kind of a front end for all of your uh, RESTful backends or RESTful endpoints. Uh, S3 is just a storage service. You can store anything in an S3. You would have done a lot of S3, I would imagine, in the DevOps module. Uh, you probably haven't seen any of the first four before, but I'm, or I'm guessing you would have uh, played a little bit with S3. So as you know, S3 is essentially a a um, let's call it a file storage service uh, but i mean essentially it is serverless um, uh, sns and sqs are messaging services we will see those at the back end of this module pretty sure you haven't actually used those but uh, kinesis we won't use it's for uh, data streaming Aurora, oh yeah, Aurora actually is a relational database serverless service. We won't use that either. Step functions we won't use. Fargate is a serverless service for um, hosting containers like Docker, Docker containers. Uh, we won't see that either. And there are many more. Okay, so that's fine. So we're going to focus on the AWS Lambda service for the next, uh, for the probably will certainly the remainder of this lecture, uh, but we'll come back to it every now and again. And in terms of all of the kind of services that AWS provides, AWS Lambda, uh, number one, it falls into the serverless category of services. And number two, it falls into the compute category. EC2 would be a compute service as well. Fargate uh, would be a compute service. Uh, but whereas EC2, as you know, is a VM kind of service, Fargate is a container service. Uh, Lambda is a is kind of at the function level. Okay, so it's for units of code much smaller than what you would deploy to an EC2 instance or even a container instance. Um, I think I might have just grabbed this straight out of the AWS documentation. Okay, so I'm saying here it's it, it's event driven. So you you can picture now that we we've written a function and it is a function, you know, a TypeScript function, a Python function, a Java function. Uh, although in Java they actually call them lambdas as well. We've written a function and we have deployed. We can deploy that unit of granularity up to Lambda. Now the question is, how do we trigger the execution of that function? Um, well, we can associate some event with the triggering of the of the Lambda function. And we'll see uh, ways of doing that later on. But essentially it's, it's, sort of, it's an event driven piece of code. It's serverless, we know what we, mean by, what, we, what we mean by that, but just to repeat it, what it means now is we can just upload our, in our case, it will be TypeScript function. We can upload our TypeScript function. Okay, we can tell Lambda, um, we want this, uh, this is a TypeScript function. Well, in fact, it will be JavaScript because it has to be compiled down to JavaScript. We can tell the Lambda service uh, what version of the Node platform we want it to run on. Um, 
we can tell it uh, one or two other things as well, like how much RAM memory do we want to have allocated to it and a few other attributes. Uh, and that's it really. Uh, we can tell it as well the something about the lower level hardware that we want to run it on if we if we if that is particular to whatever uh, the function is doing. The the AWS service then it takes care of provisioning all of that underlying layers for our function whenever it comes to executing it. Um, and that's fine. When eventually the event, whatever the event that, that is going to trigger the execution of our Lambda, whenever that occurs, what the AWS service does is it it um, creates an instance of what is kind of referred to as a micro VM. So we don't need to go into the detail of it, but uh, the micro VM will be configured then according to how you asked it to configure the environment for our function. You know, what version of the node platform do we want to have installed? What dependencies do we want to have included with that? Uh, in other words, what kind of node modules do we want to have uh, uh, installed in this micro VM? So the, the Lambda service creates an instance of this micro VM, which is our runtime environment. It then loads our code into that micro VM and then it executes the function. If there are no other immediate events for that function to handle, it'll just throw away the micro VM. Later on, another event occurs, which is targeting our function and the Lambda service goes through the whole process again, creates a micro VM, configures it appropriately, loads our function into it and executes the function. It'll hold on to the micro VM for a short period of time, just in case there are other events uh, that are targeting our function, just in case they occur. And if they do, then it just simply reruns the function. It doesn't have to go provisioning the micro VM again, obviously it has it. Interestingly though, if, if, there, are, if there are a number of parallel events targeting our Lambda, uh, Lambda does not queue up the events and execute them one by one. It will actually provision uh, a number of micro VMs that are configured accordingly and has the code loaded into them accordingly and execute those uh, micro VMs in parallel, okay? So that's kind of the scalability side of things. It will scale up based on the volume of events that are occurring in parallel. Okay, um, so that's kind of the big picture of, of what's going on there. It's been around since 2014, so it's 10 years of it there. And it's obviously been fine-tuned uh, in that period. So essentially it's kind of custom code, this is our function, that runs in an ephemeral uh, container stroke micro VM. Ephemeral simply means that, you know, once the function has finished executing, and if there are no other events targeting that function, then the, the AWS service will just throw away the micro VM uh, and it'll create a new instance whenever it needs to. Uh, so that's fine. Uh, we often refer to this as like as a function as a service that's the kind of level we're at the whole cloud started off with infrastructure as a service then we had platform as a service you've heard of all of these acronyms before so software as a service well we can add to that list now function as a service these are the different levels of cloud um, services that are available to the to us developers Uh, so this is kind of what I've been saying, right? Uh, event occurs, whatever the event source is, and we'll see a number of different sources for uh, the event that's going to trigger our Lambda function. So whatever the event source is, it will uh, pass the event to the Lambda service, and it's up to the Lambda service then to invoke our Lambda function. This is representing my Lambda function. Uh, we refer to it as the Lambda function, whereas this is the Lambda service. It will 
execute my lambda function. I t talked about that a few moments ago. Uh, the lambda function does whatever it does. It may well be need to communicate with other AWS services, typically a database or a messaging service, but it does its thing anyway. Uh, and that's the, that's the basic kind of uh, runtime model. So what I'm saying here is that the event source or the, the trigger for our Lambda function, it could be HTTP request, which is the one that we will see most often. Uh, it could be, I'm saying a change in a database, in a data store. So for example, you can have a situation where when you upload something to an S3 bucket, you want that event to be the trigger for your Lambda function. And the actual event that's passed to the Lambda function then will contain the details of uh, the object that was uploaded to the S3 bucket. Or you could have a situation where whenever a new, whenever a change happens to a database, you want that to be the trigger for your Lambda function. So there are, there are any, any number of different sources for triggering your Lambda function. The Lambda function itself, it can be written in any code, uh, pretty much anyway. Uh, all the most popular languages are supported. We're, we'll specifically be dealing with node-based Lambda functions, but that's just our decision. Um, yeah. So like these are some uh, some of the things that I've already mentioned now, right? So there's, there's, there's auto scaling. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but I've kind of given you an outline of it. The, this idea that if you have multiple parallel occurrences of the uh, event that's targeting our function, then the Lambda service will create multiple micro VMs to handle the processing of those events in parallel. Uh, does load balancing between those multiple micro VMs. It won't keep creating micro VMs uh, endlessly, like there is an upper limit. Um, so once it hits that upper limit, then if there are more events to be processed, then it'll just load balance between the various micro VMs that are currently uh, kind of warmed up, so to speak. It takes care of anything below the function code then all the layers, all the software layers be below the, below our function code, it takes care of all of that. Okay. So that'd be the node modules, the underlying operating system and so on and so forth. It also takes care of any security related issues. So maybe we want to ensure that our Lambda function can only be executed by certain event sources and also that our Lambda function should only be able to communicate with certain services. We want to restrict its its reach. Okay, and the way we would do that is by the IAM service, which you are kind of familiar with. So we have uh, we have this notion of as uh, an execution role associated with Lambda. Take care of utilization. You know, providing sufficient RAM, CPU power, network bandwidth, uh, etc. On the right, then you know. I've kind of already kind of mentioned these things. We're down now at the function level as the unit of scalability, uh, the function level at the as the unit of deployment. So going back to your RESTful Web API, there may be certain parts of your RESTful Web API that there is a lot of events occurring that are targeting it, and other parts of the Web API that aren't as active. So you can control the scalability of the very active parts, as opposed to in the good old days of EC2, where you, you'd scale up multiple copies of your EC2. Mm -hmm. Now you're just scaling up multiple copies of a particular piece of functionality within your overall application. Uh, you have to remember that your lambdas are, you have to write them so that they're stateless. If there are two consecutive executions of a particular Lambda instance within a micro VM, then the Lambda has no kind of memory of the previous execution. You can't kind of pass 
data between one invocation of a lambda and another invocation of it. Okay, it's stateless, so you have to be aware of that. Um, the, the lambda is obviously only executed, it's only loaded into a, a runtime environment when it's needed, uh, as opposed to the EC2 kind of world where the EC2 instance was always sitting there, even though it was idle. It was still sitting there and you were still paying for it. And you only pay for uh, how much uh, execution you actually, the, the Lambda is actually, uh, how many executions of it are, are occurring. You pay per execution. Now we will just be writing TypeScript Lambdas, but Lambdas, irrespective of what language you, you write them in, have the same kind of structure. Um, and that is, there is a, a part of the Lambda is initialization code and then we have what's called the handler part. The handler is the actual, is where your kind of logic is. Okay, strictly speaking, I suppose that is the function, that's the lambda function. But there, if, there may be initialization code as well, which you should, you don't, uh, you should rather than must, but it, it, it's a strong should. Um, you, you put the initialization code outside of your handler function. Now, typical examples of initialization code would be if you want to make a connection with a database or if you want to make a connection with a messaging service, you put that code outside here. We'll see a little bit later on why you do that. In the body of the function then, the, what we call the handler generically, that's where your logic is. You can have other functions as well, but these functions are private. These are functions down here would just be functions that are invoked by your handler. So this is the lambda function, I guess you would say here, the handler. Uh, and the handler, i.e. your function, it is past the event object itself. Uh, the lambda service takes care of that. There are, there are two parameters. Uh, is it two or three? Two, I know, definitely. Two parameters of your of your handler. The first is the actual event that occurred, because presumably the, the Lambda function needs to know about that. Uh, that's passed in the form of a JSON object in our case. There's also a context object, which uh, we don't ever really use, but it does give you access to the runtime environment or runtime information if that were important. Now there's the initialization code, which is this code up here, right? That's always executed before the handler for obvious reasons, I suppose, because it, it's performing something that the handler will need to use subsequently. Uh, and I was talking there a while back about, so an event occurs, the Lambda service, provisions our micro VM, loads in our code and executes the code. Now it will execute the initialization code first and then it'll execute the handler. If there is another event immediately following, so it, it hasn't thrown away the micro VM, it's actually held on to it. Uh, so a second event occurs in a short period after the first one. The Lambda service, in this case, it, it will not execute the initialization code because that is still now uh, kind of active, if you like. Whatever connections were made up here are still available. It will, in, this, in the case of the second event, it will only call the handler. Yeah. So the, the first execution we refer to as a cold start of our micro VM, the second execution is referred to as a warm start, but they have to occur in quick succession. Otherwise the micro VM has been thrown away and uh, we start out kind of all over again. Uh, in terms of configuring your Lambda function, stroke handler, people call it different names. Uh, in terms of configuring it, uh, and configuring the runtime resources that it requires. And by runtime resources, we mean how much CPU power, how much RAM, 
how much network bandwidth does it need? Uh, you cannot configure all of those attributes. The Lambda uh, service designers decided that the only thing that you can control as a developer is how much RAM space it needs. And based on the amount of RAM space that you ask the Lambda service to pr provide for your handler, then that will determine how much virtual uh, CPUs it allocates to the execution of the handler. Okay. Uh, so as I said, that was just a decision that the Lambda service designers made rather than giving the developer control over too many um, uh, attributes of the runtime environment. You can only control one attribute, that's the RAM space. And I'm just giving you some examples here. So the smallest amount of RAM that you can ask the Lambda service to provide, make available to your Lambda function is 128 megabytes. It scales up to over 3000 megs uh, in chunks of that size. Okay. And I've kind of mentioned this already. So for example, if you ask the Lambda service, you want to pr provide this amount of RAM, then that equates to one full virtual CPU that's allocated to your Lambda function. So if you had very kind of heavy parallel processing going on inside your Lambda function, that would mean you probably need more RAM. And also there would be more uh, virtual CPU units allocated to your function. We're not going to get into that level of uh, configuration at all. Uh, right. Uh, now, something that you do need to tell the Lambda service about your Lambda function is uh, what's, what's referred to as a timeout setting. The timeout setting is how long do you think um, your Lambda function needs to complete its execution. And again, that's something that you will need to tune over time. We won't be doing it, but in the real life, in the real world, it's something that you would tune uh, from testing. So the timeout is how many seconds are you telling the Lambda service to give to your function to allow it to complete its execution. And so if your function doesn't complete within the timeout limit, then the Lambda service will uh, uh, will uh, stop your Lambda function. It, it'll kind of uh, send a shutdown signal to the micro VM. Okay. Um, the, max, the minimum is, sorry, I'm saying the default is three seconds. So if you don't tell it anything, it will only allow it three seconds to complete its execution. The max is 15 minutes. So, Lambda functions are not suitable for very kind of heavy, let's say, batch processing type uh, uh, functionality, you know, something that might take an hour to complete. You cannot write a Lambda function for that kind of situation. It's only, it's only suitable for short uh, processing times. Okay, demo. So we want to... We're going to go back to our CDK world. We want to write a CDK stack that will provision um, one Lambda function. It's about as simple as I can make it. So if I go back to VS Code, uh, okay, yeah. So here's my we, we, we know the structure of our CDK project now. And we know that in the lib folder, that's where the main action is. And so here's my, here's my stack. Here's my constructor as before. And for example, here's how we get the CDK to create a stack that's just comprised of one Lambda. Now, if we just look at the import at the top here, uh, there is, so again, I'm using the AWS CDK library, and I'm particularly looking uh, using the AWS Lambda part of that library. 
And fortunately, there is within that, there is a part of the library that is specifically targeting um, JavaScript Lambda functions, because essentially our Lambda function is going to be at runtime and it's going to be JavaScript code. We can write it in TypeScript code, but uh, it'll be compiled down to JavaScript code. And there is a convenience um, class available to us called the Lambda node class. Okay, so we're using that down here. So I'm creating a new instance of that class. Um, and within that, I wanted to create, an, it looks like a node.js function. Again, so th th this node.js function is an example of a an L2 construct in the language of CDK. And all of these L2 constructs have the same number of parameters. Kind of repeating myself from the last day now. The first parameter is what is the scope of this L2 construct? It's always this, as in it's the current stack. What name do you want to give to the construct, which will really be the name for our Lambda? And then this is the configuration. Let me just drop that. Um, this is the configuration settings for my Lambda. Some of them, there are others that I'm just leaving as defaults. Uh, I could really have left this one as default, the architecture, but I'm just specifying an architecture. I'm saying the runtime is going to be node.js18. Uh, and again, what's nice about uh, writing this in TypeScript, writing the CD code, K code in TypeScript is, you know, there's a really nice IntelliSense built into it. So if I just go that there, we can see, you know, these are all the different um, environments that it supports. So I'm specifically going node. And these looks like the different versions of node that it supports. So it, you cannot have anything lower than node 18. I thought it supported 16 as well, but doesn't look like it. Uh, let me just check. Oh, these are kind of grayed out now. So anyway, uh, 18 is good enough for us. Uh, so that's the the runtime environment. Entry, you just point it at the Lambda function itself. My Lambda function is up here. We'll talk about it and we'll look at it in a second. It's just a hello world. That's the entry point. The timeout I mentioned to you, okay, I've set it to 10 seconds, but it certainly doesn't need that. I could have left it at the default, which is three seconds. And I've also asked it to allocate the lowest amount of memory. Now there are other parameters and you won't need to, to find out what are the other parameters, but if you did want to find out what other settings can I control here, uh, if you just mouse over this, right, and I click on it, it opens up a TypeScript declaration file. It's a .d.ts file, which is buried inside in my node modules folder. Uh, where's my node modules folder? Inside here, yeah? You can see from the path name anyway. And it's brought me to here, right? So the constructor for that node.js function class is what I'm landed on here. Takes three arguments and the last one is of type node.js function props. And if I click on that, this looks like these are the different attributes uh, that you can configure. Now, you won't need to uh, look at the detail of these, but you can if you want to find out all of that kind of information without leaving uh, without leaving VS Code, essentially. And we're back to our Lambda. So that's it, right? That's my stack. I've already ran CDK deploy on this. And so if I go over to my AWS console, And if I just go straight into the Lambda service and select functions, and I have one function, and this is the actual 
Lambda function. If I click on it, go into it. And if I go into the code part, Okay, this is the code here on the left, which is all, uh, sorry, that's not code. Should be able to see the code there, but uh, I need to click on something, obviously. Oh no, here we go. Oh, it should display the code there on the right now. Okay, I'm not going to waste time. It um, you can't see the code, even though it's not of much use to us because it's it's raw JavaScript. If I go back to VS Code, here's my Lambda standard TypeScript file. Now, because it's Lambda, uh, it has to respect the the signature um, and so I'm importing a type a function type uh, from my CDK from my AWS Lambda SDK okay this is one of the dependencies in my package.json if you look for it so that's handler is as I said it's a function signature type alias I guess and Here's the function. Okay, it's an asynchronous function, obviously, because it's invoked uh, across the network. This is a reference to the event that occurred that's triggering my Lambda, the context if I want to uh, manipulate the, or get some information on the runtime environment, which I don't do. And all I'm doing is doing a console log. I have to write a, have to write in the try cast block because something could go wrong in my Lambda. Uh, not really in this case, so I could I could have really left out the try catch block, but uh, I do need to return something because that's what the handler dictates. So I'm just returning a status two hundred with a message, and I've got a catch block as well. Okay, very done, very simple. That's my lambda. Now, in terms of triggering this lambda, the one way I, I can do it from the management console. If we go back there, there was a test. You know, you can test it from here, but instead what we'll do is we can trigger it from the CLI. And to trigger it from the CLI, you've got to get the full name of the Lambda. Right now for jumping around, but if I go back here, uh, this is the full name uh, generated by the AWS service actually, and as you can see, it's obviously a combination of the stack name, the function name, and just a hash value. That's the, uh, so I need to use that in my AWS CLI command. And if I do that, let's go back. Uh, so the, com the AWS CLI command, I'll just put in here for my own convenience. So I can do this first, right? If I just run this command, it'll give me a list of all my lambdas. So I could have taken it from the management console. 
There's my function name. Copy that. And to actually invoke the Lambda, this is the command that I use. So I'll just stick the name in here. Now, some of these options in the the Lambda invoke command aren't really necessary in this case. So, for example, the payload, I'm, I'm not passing any data to my Lambda function. But if I did, that's how I would do it from the CLI anyway, where the data is has to be a JSON structure, set of key value pairs. And the response then is going to be stored in a file. I have to give it the name of a file to store the response in. So if I just grab that, Try to, to exit from the list function, just hit Q to quit. Okay, so that's my command. And okay, it looks like I'm getting a 200 response, but the full response that was returned by the Lambda is stored inside in a JSON file. So if I look for the file in my project, here's the JSON file here. And that kind of corresponds to the return statement in my Lambda. If we go back to the Lambda itself. Okay. It corresponds to this this return statement. So that seems to have uh, seems to have worked. The question is though, I have a console log here. Where did the console log go to? And the answer to that is uh, it's would have been sent to the CloudWatch service, which you would have come across uh, in the DevOps module last year. So if I go into the CloudWatch service now, I should find evidence of uh, the console log statement there. So let's do that. Now you might remember the way CloudWatch log works is, um, well, in the case of Lambda functions using CloudWatch, the CloudWatch service creates a log group for every Lambda function. And the log group is broken up into log streams. And so there is a log stream instance created for each execution of your Lambda function. So let's go into CloudWatch logs first. Now there's a lot to the CloudWatch servers, but we're only interested in the logs part of it. And in the log groups. And here's the log group and the name given to the log group again is generated by the CloudWatch servers. And it's, it's kind of based on uh, what other what what is the other service that is actually sending logs to me? And in, in our case, it's AWS Lambda. So that's kind of it prefixes the log group with that part. The rest then is looks like it's the actual Lambda function name itself, right? But again, it's kind of uh, you can control that from the CDK, but that's the default name given to the log group. So if I go into the log group. And there you will find, amongst other things, the log streams and a log stream. These are the log streams. As I said, there's a log stream instance created for each execution of your Lambda function. Now, we've only ran it once. So, uh, oh, I might have ran it earlier on, actually. So it looks like there are two uh, log streams there. 
so they'll both be the exact same. Let's just go into their date stamped anyway. So this looks like it's the more recent one, although that timing is odd. Oh, no, it's right. It's right, sorry. And here's the log stream. And it's obvious, like it starts, uh, it starts, let's see. Just gonna bump it up a little bit. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, there's a start, and then this is the one that will actually from well, it's obvious, I guess, but between the start and the report, there will be a line for each console log statement in your will start and end actually. Between the start and end, there will be a line in the log stream for each console log statement in your code. And so we only had one. And if we and you can see right over here, right, that what was console logged is I expand that. Yeah. Um, what was console logged is I was invoked. Yeah. Let's check that in the Lambda. Yeah, that's what it console logged. Now, it's very primitive, but that's really how we will be debugging our lambdas uh, via console log statements. So it can be a bit cumbersome. There are more sophisticated debugging uh, techniques, ava uh, um, tools available to the developer. We just don't have time to go playing with them really. So it'll be console log statements and checking in the CloudWatt service uh, for what is being logged. So. We've written a Lambda function. We have deployed a stack that deploys that Lambda function, and we have triggered the Lambda function from the CLI. Just pause for any questions, if there are any. No. Lambda integration. Uh, by Lambda integration, I, I mean what services can trigger a Lambda? And it, uh, I'm only showing you some of them here. So pretty much there's a wide range of services uh, and resources in those services that can be the, the event source for a Lambda execution. And these various uh, services, the, the, the the, the model that is used for invoking the Lambda is one of three models. There's a synchronous model, an asynchronous model, and what's called a pole-based model. So depending on the event source, it will either be using one of these three uh, invocation or triggering models. And it depends on the, on the event source. So we'll just briefly talk through these three. We'll mainly be seeing this one at the beginning of this module, but we will see the asynchronous and the pole-based invocation or triggering model towards the latter end of this module. So the synchronous integration um, is, and I think synchronous is really pretty straightforward. The, the event source for the synchronous integration can be the CLI, uh, the SDK. So if we actually wrote some code that uh, and use the AWS SDK, our code could trigger the execution of the Lambda. API Gateway, which we will see a lot of uh, from next week on. You can even get the the AWS uh, an AWS load balancer to trigger a Lambda, or you can get the Lambda service to generate a URL for your Lambda and you can trigger it via your standard kind of HTTP client, which we will see as well. 
uh, in all in the synchronous case in the synchronous integration case i'm saying the client always waits for the response and that's classic kind of synchronous communication so in our case we use the cli and the cli waited until the response came back from the aws service uh, or well our, our lambda function not the AWS service, sorry. The response came back from our Lambda function via the Lambda service. So all of these event sources here are going to, uh, the, there's going to be a wait built into them until the response comes back. Uh, that means that the client, client has to handle any kind of errors that might occur. And there are different reasons why errors might occur. The Lambda function the handler might have timed out. Uh, it might have thrown an exception. The maybe the Lambda service wasn't able to create a micro VM for you because you've exceeded your limit. There is a limit as to how many parallel micro VMs you can have running at any particular point in time. So you may have hit that limit. So there are lots of re there are lots of uh, possibilities. Uh, there are lots of cases where the Lambda function is. Uh, is going to return some sort of error response. And it's up to the client then to decide what to do. Typically, what the client will do is it will delay for a short period of time and try the request again. So there are retries and, you know, you, you obviously have to set, set a limit to that, but that's all programmable from the client side. The Lambda service doesn't deal with any kind of error handling for you. Exponential backoff is a kind of classic strategy for dealing with um, errors from a Lambda function. By exponential backoff, what that means is the client, let's say it delays for three seconds, it retries. If it gets an exception again, it will double the, the delay period. So now it's going, to, it's going to delay for six seconds, try again, still no good, still getting a, an exception response double the delay again, we're up to 12 seconds. And if if on the third um, occasion, we're still getting a response, then I guess you send a, a report back to the user or some sort of message back to the user and you kind of give up. Okay, and so just a visual here that is showing you, uh, I think it's covering, well, it's covering some of the event sources. So if it's the AWS CLI or SDK, it's essentially, it's all right. It's a standard request response. If it's this API gateway, which is a, a service that we'll see later on, where that kind of fits in the sequences, your client. So this could be a browser based client, or it could be a, con a desktop application. It's sending HTTP requests to this to an API gateway. The gateway is proxying the request onto the Lambda function. The Lambda function responds back to the gateway. The gateway sends the response back to the client. Uh, if you uh, are using what are called function URLs, which are something that's pretty new, only came in in 2022, uh, you actually can trigger the Lambda directly from the client via a URL. In the case up here, as we saw, you're actually using the function name rather than the URL. Demo two. Let's uh, let's use the function URL. So we'll get this. We'll get the Lambda service to generate a URL for our Lambda function, and that will then allow us just to uh, use a standard HTTP client. Could be just a browser or something like Postman. And I'll also demonstrate how you can make that URL private okay or uh, secure it in some way because that's a that's a feature that uh, you might want to have associated with your url and so how do we how do we get the lambda service to generate a url for our lambda function well if i go back to my stack file and if i just enable this code here 
So it turns out that the what you what the the reference that you get back here, which is a reference to a what is it a, a Node.js L2 construct that has lots of methods associated with it. Uh, and so this method, as you can tell from the name, is how we can how we can get the Lambda service to generate a URL for our Lambda function. So this is just a function call. We're essentially kind of configuring, doing some extra configuration on our Node.js uh, function L, uh, L2 construct. And it looks like, again, if you want, if you wanted to find out what is the signature for this particular function, again, if you just mouse over it, it brings you to the TypeScript declaration file for that function, which is here. Looks like it takes two, one parameter, okay? The parameter is of type this. Well, what's the shape of that, I wonder? You can drill down into it, and it gives you the exact, we're at the interface, TypeScript data interface level, and so you can, you know, read that if you wanted to. But we don't. Uh, you, you won't need to go down to that level of detail. So it looks like um, there are a couple of things that I need to configure. One is, do I want to have any authentication associated with this URL? And I think there are only two options available to me. If I just go back to let the IntelliSense help me. Okay. It's either you don't want any authentication, so it's just a public URL, or you want AWS IAM based. Uh, and there, that's the only type of authentication that you can associate with a Lambda function URL. Which means you need to, uh, you need to somehow include your access key and secret access key uh, in the generation of some sort of token. Uh, but that will happen behind the scenes. Uh, generate a token associated with your request, and that token then is validated by the AWS service before it allows the execution of your. Lambda function. So let's actually request that. And we'll see how we set it up. You also need to configure the cores configuration. You remember cores from last from the web dev module last year. Cross origin uh, resource sharing. Uh, and we'll just kind of leave it wide open for now. Any, any, any client, uh, any uh, origin, I suppose, can can access our URL. That's fine. Uh, this last statement here actually is, is kind of the equivalent of a console log in CDK stack code. Um, that's how you can kind of interpret this. So we want to output onto the terminal really when we do our CDK deploy, we wanted to output the actual URL that was generated by the AWS service for my, uh, for my function. So let's uh, deploy this, which is really kind of an update on my stack. I should have checked my problems page because there's a problem. The CDK won't deploy, obviously, if there are any errors in either your CDK code. Well, it's only the CDK code, actually. So what did I do? Uh, got rid of a comma up here. 
Now, while that's the client, um, what we will use as our HTTP client, we know we, yeah, we'll have to use in this case because it's going to be a private URL. Uh, we will use Postman. I think you might have come across Postman again in the Web App Dev module from last year. If not, it's uh, it's pretty easy to use, really. Uh, so if I start up my Postman app. And in the language of kind of Postman, what you can do is uh, you can create uh, collections. Um, so the way you create a collection, let's see. I just click here, create a blank collection, because there might be different types of requests that you want to uh, test. Uh, HTTP based request that you want to test. Obviously, it's only HTTP clients that we're talking about here now. So I'll just call it demos. And when I create a collection, I can also declare variables. A collection is made up of a number of requests, right? So I'm creating a collection, and a number of those requests within a collection, they may have certain attributes that are common across all of them. And so rather than typing those out for each in for each request within a collection, I can declare a variable and just use the variable uh, as a kind of a shorthand. You can also control the authentication uh, method used. So I've done that already, actually, I've created a collection called uh, where did I put it? Here, function demos. So that's a collection I created. And for that collection, I declared some variables as well. So if I go into the variables section, which I'm in, okay, variables are just key value pairs. So I created a variable called URL, and in there I'm going to paste in the a function URL that will be generated by the AWS servers for me. Um, I'm also creating a variable that's going to hold my AWS access key. And I could have put in a variable as well for the secret access key, because I'm going to be using those variables in the various requests that I'm going to be setting up for myself. And I have two requests set up here. Uh, and the only one that we're interested in now is the private URL. Uh, test that I want to do. So if I go into this request, and the way you create a new request is if you just right click, I think you can get it from over here, actually. You know, just go. Uh, where is it? Add request. And then just configure it. So I've done that. So if I look at this one here, so requests, you have to configure, well, is it a get, put, post, or delete request? I'm, I'm actually assuming you've, you've used this already, even though I'm going through it. Uh, in our case, it's always going to be a get request. Here, I'm actually using one of my variables that I've defined at the collection level. You remember, I declared a variable called URL. So if you want to use one of your collection level variables, just wrap it in it double curly braces. If I just get rid of that, actually. And I start off with a double curly brace. Then it'll hint me, and I'm going to pick this one. That's my URL. In terms of authentication, if I go into here, I've said that I want to inherit the authentication that has been defined at the at the collection level. Uh, I could have configured the authentication model here directly, but I just decided uh, to define it at the collection level. So if I go back to my collection, it also has an authentication tab. 
here. And here are the different authentication methods that the Postman supports. Okay. The authentication method that we are interested in is the AWS uh, SIGV4 authentication metal, uh, method. Uh, you don't need to know the detail of that authentication model, but what it does mean is I have to configure some attributes of this authentication method. And if I scan down here, I need to specify my AWX access key. In my case, I'm using the variable that I defined at the collection level for that. I need to specify my secret access key. So this is just the raw form of my access key. I'll, I'm obviously going to change this later on because this is a, a potential a security risk for me. So I have my access key um, pair set up at the collection level. You also have to specify what region uh, you're targeting the HTTP request on, which in my case is EU West 1, and also what service you are sending the request to, which I am setting to Lambda. Okay, so you'll be doing all of this in the in this week's lab. So that's the authentication that I that I have actually decided to configure at the collection level, you can also configure it at the individual request level. So back to my request, which is this one here. So I want to send a GET request to the URL that has been generated for me. And I am using the authentication method uh, that I've defined at the collection level. Now, if I go back to the collection though, I need to, I need to change the value for the URL variable. This is one that I was playing with earlier. And if I go back to my CDK, to my VS code, um, you can see here, this is the URL. This entire line was generated as a result of this statement, which, as I said, is kind of equivalent to a, a console log. So if I grab that URL, I could get the URL at the AWS Management Console level as well. You poke around the Lambda service. Grab that. Back to Postman. Now make sure you paste it into the, the current value, not the initial value. It's the current value that's used in the request that's eventually sent. Okay, so, and also remember to save it because it doesn't save it automatically. So if I go back to my specific request, which is this one, and I'm now ready to hit the send button. And I'm getting a message back and this is corresponding to, if I look at my Lambda, it's corresponding to the response from, from my Lambda, which we saw earlier on anyway. It's the same Lambda function. Okay, that is the message. So that looks like it worked for me. Um, if I try and, if I try and access the Lambda from the URL, without providing the authentication uh, details, then, so I've got an example of that here. If I try to access it as a public URL, so this is a GET request to the URL, but in terms of the authentication, uh, I have no authentication specified. Send that request.
and I'm essentially getting a 403 forbidden. So it's the Lambda service now that has returned that to me, not the Lambda function, because the service, my request actually has to go via the Lambda service to the Lambda function or the handler. And it's the Lambda service that will validate the authentication that's included with the with the request. I think the authentication comes in the form of authentication headers. It's not a query string that's kind of generated at the end of the URL, although I'm not positive about that. I think it's authentication headers. It depends on the AWS SIG v4 protocol anyway. Okay, so I've just demonstrated triggering a Lambda function using a URL that was generated for that function by me, for me by the AWS service as a result of my CDK stack um, requesting it, if you like. Okay, uh, let's push on. Now, uh, if I go back a few slides again, I said there were three invocation models we've uh, i've demonstrated the synchronous model uh, using the both the cli and using a function url the asynchronous invocation model uh, we will see uh, much later on in this module but just to give you kind of an overview of what's going on there um the asynchronous invocation model is used by something like S3. So for example, when you upload an object to an S3 bucket, you can, via your uh, infrastructure configuration, you can associate that event with the triggering of a Lambda function. And we will see that, as I said, later on. Now, the way it actually works though, uh, for the S3 case, I'm kind of demonstrating down here. So whatever way we uh, upload our object from the from our client, uploads an object to the S3 bucket. That will cause the S3 service to tell the Lambda service that this event has occurred. The Lambda service registers that event in a queue that it has created specifically for my Lambda function. My Lambda function is over here. And so, and the Lambda function then is invoked by the Lambda service with entries. There may be more than one because there might be a high volume of uploads happening to my S3 bucket. Uh, so there may be a number of events in this queue. The Lambda service will call my Lambda service, my Lambda function, and pass it a batch of the entries in this queue uh, and the, the batch of entries will have details on each of the objects, information about each of the objects that was uploaded. And the function does its thing, whatever that is. It may actually uh, want to read the object from the bucket, but whatever it does, it does some processing. Now, I'm saying this is uh, classified as an asynchronous communication flow. And it's asynchronous when you look at the client and the Lambda. The client in this case uploads the bucket. The S3 service, service will respond saying, you have, uh, the, the upload has been successful. And the client is now out of the loop. The triggering of the Lambda function is, happens subsequent to that. But the client on the left is not waiting for the Lambda function to to execute and uh, send a response back to the client. So it's it's in that sense that this is an asynchronous triggering of my Lambda function. It's asynchronous uh, when you look at the client, which is on the extreme left, versus the Lambda function, which is on the extreme right. There isn't a, it, the client isn't waiting for the Lambda function to execute and send a response back to it. Now that has implications, of course. To how does the client eventually find out that the processing done by the Lambda was successful? That's a problem for another day. Um, 
So the trigger for this asynchronous model could be an S3 um, from the S3 service. It could be from an SNS service, which is a messaging service, CloudWatch. I think there are a few others as well. And I've kind of already alluded to this anyway, or explained this. The Lambda service places the events in a queue. So this queue structure is created behind the scenes by the Lambda service specifically for a Lambda function. So you may have a number of Lambda functions that are triggered based on this asynchronous model and they each have their own queue. You never have to worry about provisioning this queue. It's taken care of for you by the Lambda service. Um, all you've got to do from a CDK point of view is somehow uh, express the fact that the uploading of an object to the bucket uh, should be the trigger source for your Lambda. You describe that in, in CDK code and the CloudFormation service will take care of provisioning the various resources to achieve that. Uh, the Lambda service, you know, what if the Lambda fails, right? It throws an exception or it times out or there are too many Lambda instances currently running, so it, it can not create a new instance. So whatever, whatever the source of your Lambda execution failing, uh, who, who handles that? In this case, it's not going to be the client because the client, uh, once it has successfully uploaded the bucket, it's no longer uh, involved in the, the whole process. Uh, it's actually the Lambda service in this case. So if the Lambda function fails, the Lambda service will take care of retrying the function again and getting it to passing it a batch of the entries in this queue. Uh, and it keeps retrying three times using this kind of exponential back off uh, strategy that I briefly outlined earlier on. Uh, eventually it gives up though, uh, and you can tell it what to do if it's constantly failing. You can tell it actually to maybe put the events into some other messaging service and have them handled there. But uh, that's uh, so it's the Lambda service that takes care of dealing with any exceptions that might occur in your Lambda function for this asynchronous integration model. Uh, I'm saying that the I'm saying here that the actual Lambda function, in this case, it has to be implemented in an idempotent way. You might remember idempotency from any database um, studies that you've done. You see, if if the, let's say there are three events in this queue, right? And the Lambda service has invoked my Lambda and it has processed the first event successfully, processed the second event successfully, but it throws an exception on the third event. Now it has received the three events as one batch, but it has crashed on the processing of third event. So the Lambda service will retry it, but it's gonna actually pass it the three events all over again. So that now means it's gonna be processing the first two for a second time. So you've gotta make sure that whatever the nature of the processing is that, um, uh, the the processing is idempotent in its nature. It's not sort of making update changes to a database. So in that case, if it was updates, an update operation is not an idempotent operation. I don't want to get too into detail on idempotency. I'm just mentioning it here for completeness purposes. But um, it would mean like if, if it was a database update that it was doing, then it would be updating three times. And depending on how you implemented that update operation, that may be uh, uh, result in your database being in a state that is not an actual accurate reflection of whatever events have occurred. That's very vague, I know, but um, as I said, I'm just mentioning this for, for completeness sake. We won't be too concerned about item potency. Uh, it's suitable, and this, this whole model is suitable, you know, uh, where essentially the client doesn't have to wait for the functioning of the event to occur. It can just happily carry on doing its thing. And there are many cases where that's fine. You're not always 
looking or you're not always dependent on synchronous response back from the lambda function. That's the asynchronous model uh, in outline. The third model has a couple of names. The official name is event source mapping, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's more commonly referred to as pole based. If I just go back to the previous asynchronous model, um, in this case, in the asynchronous case, and in, in particular in relation to, let's say, S3, it's the S3 service that is telling the Lambda service about the event happening, okay? So the, the event source is actually telling the Lambda service that the event has occurred, and then the Lambda service deals with it. Uh, in the pole-based approach, it kind of works the other way. Now, first of all, which services are modeled on this pole-based triggering of a Lambda? DynamoDB streams is one, uh, SQS and Kinesis, and there are a few others as well. Uh, let's look at a particular example. So here's a Dynamo, this is representing a DynamoDB database. And I have a client, and let's say it adds a new record to the database. Now, we want to we want to trigger a Lambda function, which is way down here. We want to trigger a Lambda function whenever changes happen to our database. Uh, and so we configure the infrastructure to achieve that, and we'll see how to do that uh, uh, towards the back end of this module. So we have configured the infrastructure. How does it work then at runtime? The way it works is the client makes a change to the state of the database. The database actually logs all the changes that are happening to it. And periodically, the Lambda service will pull the database asking it uh, have any changes occurred, any state changes occurred in in the database since I last polled you. So it's the Lambda service now is actually talking to uh, the other service, whereas in the case of S3, the S3 service was talking, was initiating the processing. Here, it's the Lambda service is doing it. It's polling the database. Uh, it gets a list of the changes that have happened as a response, again, it kind of puts those events into a queue. So it's state changes that are occurring here. That's the event that's triggering that I want to trigger my Lambda. The events are stored here in some sort of queue structure. And again, my Lambda uh, is fed these events in batches and it processes each of the events. For the, for, for the uh, maybe third or fourth time, it it is this the idea that the lambda service is actually asking the other service uh sh essentially kind of should i run the lambda now okay whereas in the other case it was the in our case it was the s3 service that told lambda you should probably you should run this lambda uh now yep uh okay the lambda service pulls that's okay lambda service invokes that's okay as well and there are, you know, the same kind of, the same kind of exception handling occurs in this case. You know, if the Lambda function throws an exception, the Lambda service will retry it a number of times. Same kind of idea. Lambda service has an API. Every AWS service has an API, and that's what allows other services to communicate with it. So the Lambda service is no different. So in the picture that we have, we've got our Lambda service here on the right. It has an API interface. In other words, a kind of a HTTP interface. Uh, it doesn't. It's not necessarily a RESTful interface, but it's a uh, uh, it's HTTP based anyway, and. There is an SDK accompanying that API and all of the other services that can trigger a Lambda function. And we've talked about some of them. Okay. S3 can trigger it. DynamoDB can trigger it. Um, API Gateway can trigger a Lambda function. All of those services are essentially using the Lambda SDK to communicate with the Lambda service. And that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here or illustrate here. Um, use my all, that's okay. 
uh, can pass. Yeah, uh, the actual event itself is just a or the payload associated with the event that can be any type of data structure, or you know, you know, think of a JSON structure. It can be of any shape. The Lambda service doesn't look at the the Lambda service doesn't look at the shape of the event to ensure that it it has the proper structure. You may want to do that within the Lambda function, but uh, by default, anyway, the Lambda service doesn't do any kind of validation of the event before it passes it on to the Lambda function. Now, a Lambda function has an execution role associated with it. And the execution role is, is a role in the sense of IAM roles. I said at the very beginning, that the Lambda service uses IAM uh, for security uh, related issues. And so here's one part of that. So each Lambda function has an execution role generated for it and assigned to that function. And there's a one-to-one -one relationship because that is best practice as you might've learned from last year's DevOps module. Um, so, uh, and. And so the, the execution role I'm saying here, it grants the Lambda function uh, permission to access uh, other services. So this is now, wh what can the Lambda itself do? What other services can it communicate with? And that is dictated by the execution role. And as you know, the way IAM works, and we talk about roles and policies, and the policy specifies exactly what is allowed by whatever entity that policy is associated with. Well, we, we attach a policy to a role and then we attach a role to your resource. In our case, the resource is a Lambda function. Uh, so that's okay. Um, there are lots of predefined roles specifically for Lambda functions, just as a convenience. And I'm just listing some of them here. This is the minimum, uh, the minimum uh, permissions that a Lambda function will need. Every Lambda function has to be allowed to write to CloudWatch logs, just as our Lambda did. Uh, and for that reason, that means that our Lambda function, it must have this role uh, attached to it. Can I prove that? I go back to the AWS or to the management console. And if I go into the, where am I? If I go into the Lambda service. And if I go into my Lambda function. And if I look at configuration, and here we go, execution role. Here I've got some information on the execution role associated with my Lambda. And here's the role uh, that was generated by, strictly speaking, it was generated by CloudFormation. Okay, I use the CDK stack, uh, our CDK, but as we know from my discussion last week, the CDK actually generates a cloud formation template. And in that template that was generated, it included the fact that I wanted a, a, a role, an execution role, or well, sorry, an IAM role created for my Lambda. And that role should be made the execution role of the Lambda. The name given to the role is just generated. So this is just a, again, a generated role name, but if I click through to it, and I want to see the details of this role. Here are the permission policies. And lo and behold, uh, this one here, if you can read it, that is one of the predefined policies that the Lambda service 
uh, sorry, that the IAM service has. And if I even click through to it, that policy, you might remember these policies are written in JSON, uh, but can we actually see the JSON? If I go into the JSON of that IAM policy, I think he had it. He looked briefly at these policies last year. Uh, we won't be writing IAM policies, but if we look at this part here, it looks like this policy is all about uh, creating new log streams, uh, creating new log groups, which is exactly what we want our Lambda function to be allowed to do. Uh, because it has a console log statement. Okay, so the execution role controls what other services your Lambda function uh, can use. And in our case, the only service it wants to be able to use is CloudWatch logs, and it wants to be able to create a log group and or initiate the creation of a log group and write new log streams to that log group. And I've, I'm trying to demonstrate here, and I'll try to show you that. Uh, the execution role that was generated for our specific Lambda function does seem to have those permissions and, and nothing else, uh, which is right because our Lambda function doesn't really do anything else other than console logs. So that's the notion of a Lambda function having an execution role. Now, you know, if I go back to my VS code, And if I go to my stack file, I don't have anything in here about execution role. And that's a classic example of the, the nice thing about the CDK framework is that it generates some default resources for you and configuring configurations of those automatically. You can override those defaults and we will see how to do that later on. But I because I don't have any IAM execution role related information in my CDK stack here. Then the CDK framework decided that it was uh, it would create an execution role for me, give it a generated name, and associate the particular policy, the predefined policy uh, that I showed you, associate that policy with that role, uh, and all of that would have been detailed in the cloud formation template. Uh, so that's a good example of, you know, an L2 construct. This is an L2 construct uh, that for now and now we can see that this, all right, this, uh, this L2 construct creates a Lambda instance, a Lambda function in the Lambda service. It creates an IAM role in the IAM service, links them up together, and it creates some other uh, resources as well. Uh, a Lambda also has something called a resource-based policy. And that controls who can trigger your Lambda. Okay, so we use resource-based policies to give other AWS services or other AWS accounts uh, permission uh, to use your Lambda resource, i.e. to trigger it really. Uh, so that's... Uh, uh, so again, it's it's another IAM uh, it's another IAM role stroke policy uh, that's attached to your Lambda function. Uh, so it's an, I, an IAM principle. I'm saying here. Oh yeah, I'm saying it, so. It controls what IAM principle, where principle could be either a user, another kind of AWS account, or a service. Uh, can access the Lambda function. Uh, if the IAM policy... Blah, 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 what's, oh, yeah. Uh, so there, there, there are kind of two parts to... So when the Lambda service is asked to execute a policy, to execute a Lambda function, it, it checks, first of all, uh, does the invoker 
have permission to trigger the execution of my lambda of this lambda function and it determines that from the resource based policy associated with the lambda function uh, or does the actual iam uh, does the iam policy associated with the principle does it have permission to trigger the lambda uh, so kind of confuse myself there now but there there are, there are two things that need to be checked as to whether a lambda function should be executed or not number one does the event source let's call it that does it have specific permission in its i am associated i am policies does it have specific permission to run this lambda so that would be the case for let's say if another i am if, if another aws account tried to trigger your lambda function the lambda service will check does that aws account have permission to do that if not then it will actually check the resource-based policy of the lambda function itself is it granting the iam principle uh, the other user to run your function so it's either or okay we are probably mainly going to see the latter of them where the the function's resource-based policy will control who or what can trigger it and again, if I go back to the management console, and go way back to the Lambda service. So we've got some resource-based policy stuff here, and you know, there's nothing in it because we are not allowing other services to trigger our Lambda function. We're not allowing other AWS users, i.e. other AWS accounts, to trigger our Lambda function. So the only way we can actually invoke this Lambda function is from the CLI. And of course, when we make an AWS call using the CLI, our AWS credentials, our access key and secret access key will be included in that request. So it the Lambda servers will know that the request is coming from the owner of the Lambda function, so to speak, me in this case. We can also trigger it from the function URL, but equally it's my access key and secret access key that are used to generate the HTTP authentication headers with that request. So again, I am the only person that can execute my Lambda function in this particular case. No other user can and no other service can. It's a lot of kind of uh, detail there, admittedly. But fortunately, the CDK uh, handles a lot of that with a little bit of help from us. Concurrency and throttling. Uh, so I've already kind of uh, at the very beginning there, I was talking about if you've got let concurrent events triggering uh, or targeting your Lambda function, then the Lambda service will create parallel instances of the micro VM and load our code into it and run those in, in parallel. But of course, if there's a high, very high volume of uh, events that are occurring in parallel, that means that potentially the Lambda service is going to create lots and lots of micro VM instances in parallel. Uh, and so we can't let that just keep on growing. Uh, we've got to set some sort of limit on it. Our A limit has to be set on it. Otherwise, we get a, a, a DDoS, a denial of service error back to us. So what the uh, AWS people decided is that they set a maximum of 1,000. No AWS account can have more than 1,000 concurrent executions of lambdas happening. It doesn't have to be the same Lambda function. It can be a number of different Lambda functions within an AWS account. 
but in total there can be uh, there's a maximum or an upper limit of 1000 uh, concurrent uh, micro VMs essentially that, that can be created on your behalf now you can set a limit on the number of concurrent micro VMs that are created for a particular Lambda function, and that's referred to as the reserve concurrency. This is something that we would set at the CDK level. So we can declare a reserve concurrency, which is an upper limit as to how many concurrent micro VMs can be active for a particular Lambda function. And if, if then the volume of events targeting that particular Lambda exceed this reserve concurrency limit, then the Lambda service will return a what's called a throttling exception back to the client, which is, uh, do I mention it there? It's got a HTTP number, uh, HTTP status 429. Yeah. So the Lambda service takes care of that. So it, it, uh, it uses the reserve concurrency value and uh, to control whether it should create another micro VM or return a throttling exception back to the client. And that's specifically for the asynchronous invocation model and the async, the synchronous and the asynchronous invocation models. So potentially, you know, if we had a React app that was talking to API gateway, which was triggering a Lambda function, then that throttling exception error would eventually uh, arrive back in to our React app and we would have to have some code to deal with that. And usually the typical way that you would do it is you would delay for a period and then try the request again. So, uh, but the Lambda service, it performs the throttling uh, for us. Uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here is, you know, in a in a particular AWS account, I might have a number of applications that are using the Lambda service, separate applications. So maybe one application has an application load balancer, which is triggering the execution of a Lambda. Another application is has an API gateway interface, which can trigger a Lambda. And I've got another case where I've got a some code running on a local machine and it's using the AWS Lambda SDK directly and it's sending requests to a Lambda uh, function. But if you, if you do not set reserve concurrencies on each of these three applications, then potentially what could happen is one of the applications could consume all of the concurrent uh, the maximum number of concurrent instances that are available to my account. So maybe this is actually spinning up, and we said the upper limit is 1,000, let's say. Let's say this is spinning up 1,000 concurrent micro VMs running this particular Lambda function. That now means that the other two applications, uh, when they want to trigger their Lambdas at the same time as all of this is happening, they're going to get back a throttling error or throttling exception response in both cases. However, if I set a reserved concurrency on this first application, that now means that, and the reserved concurrency is obviously going to be lower than the maximum 1000. So I set a limit of let's say 500. That now means that these other two applications uh, won't be returning throttling exceptions back to their, uh, their clients or users. So the argument I'm trying to make is that it's important that you do set reserve concurrencies on each of your lambdas in your applications. Otherwise, you get this one application that's kind of hogging uh, the um, all, all of the um, all of the no, uh, number of concurrent instances that you can have created for you in your account. Not something we'll have to worry about. Finally, uh, cold starts and warm starts. I talked about the this way, way back, but just to remind you, a cold start is when the AWS service, 
creates a micro VM, loads your code into it, it executes the initialization code, and it executes the handler. Now, the initialization code may actually be quite uh, time consuming and CPU heavy. You know, if it's establishing a lot of links to other services, communication links to other services. So it is significant, but that's what a cold start is anyway. And a warm start, a warm start is when the event occurs, but there is an existing micro VM that has been already provisioned for that particular Lambda. And so in that case, it does not execute the initialization code. It only executes the handler. That's okay. I'm saying here that the initialization code it can be uh, quite time consuming and it can add to latency, which we don't like. So a solution is to define what's called a provisioned concurrency value for your Lambda. And what a provision concurrency uh, does is it tells the Lambda service to essentially create some micro VMs before any events occur and have them there uh, run their initialization code and then have them there waiting for occurrences of the event. That now means that when the events do occur, they're all going to result, uh, they're all going to be handled by quote unquote warm micro VMs. So it would be a concern, uh, certainly in industry, uh, if, if latency was an issue for a particular application. So provisioned concurrency as, a, as opposed to reserved concurrency, provisioned concurrency is this idea of getting the Lambda service to essentially pre, uh, uh, pre uh, allocate micro VMs loaded with your code and the initialization code executed uh, in waiting, if, if, if you like, for events to occur. Okay, um, there's a lot going on there. So in the lab, anyway, this week, he will go through kind of what I demonstrated, which he, he'll actually also create uh, a DynamoDB database. And I think he will get the Lambda talking to that DynamoDB database, even though we will talk about it formally. Uh, next week. So I'm going to leave it at that. I've got a few minutes if there are any questions, although, you know, we've gone for two hours, so I'm sure you're pretty tired now at this stage, but I'll open the floor anyway to any questions if they, if you have any. No. All right. Uh, so you have a lab to work on. You can either do it straight away or wait until the actual lab hours. Well, not straight away, but uh, wait until the lab hours or do it before that, whichever you prefer. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.